The following episode of Critical Weed Theory has a content warning for discussions of violence, sexism, eugenics, IQ, fascists, mild discussions of fat phobia, and we will talk at length about all of Black Lagoon, though you should still watch it. I have a big gun. <laughs> I took it from my boy. <laughs> it's true. Sick with justice. I just want to feel you. Mm-hmm. I'm your angel. Only a ring of wet. You make me violate you. No matter where you are. Okay. By all the pigs out there. They make me violate you. Get down on your knees. Get ahead on Baby your shoulders. shoulders for guys at the end of the earth. You were made to the end of the kitchen. I own the child as a me. So, um, for those folks listening to the podcast, hello, 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 hello. This is the Critical Weeb Theory Podcast, where as much as we might love Black Lagoon, no, the opening is not communist. It is, it is a disappointment. It is very edgy, though. It is incredibly edgy, and you know, I feel like a significant portion of Black Lagoon is just edge. And the edge Mm. kind of distracts from like the hardcore praxis that's going on, or... Hardcore theory, listen. Hard-ish core praxis-ish. Have you read Capital? Well, I'm sorry to say, that was a huge-ass waste of time. (laughs) You could have instead experienced your lived conditions and drawn conclusions from there. Actually, on that note, I do want to take a brief moment to talk about what is theory, why is theory. But to talk briefly about what is theory, why is theory. Um, theory is relevant because it is the summation of all past knowledge. I was just going to make a brief diatribe on how theory is relevant only because it is reflective of our modern states, Mm -hmm. the modern state of being, and thus all theory exists insofar as the way in which it builds upon past knowledge and gives us access to what has worked in the past, what hasn't worked in the past, and thus it is inaccurate to like blindly worship theory and be like, no, you can't do insert thing until you have read more reading is a way of keying into those experiences it is not the experience in and of itself and i also think like another thing to point out is leftism and left left adjacent tendencies will emerge in ways that theory didn't like predict because um a lot of it was written in the late 1800s where we didn't have the internet or um anime <laughs> <laughs> yeah Hayao Miyazaki had yet to let us all know that this thing that was anime was a completely a mistake <laughs> exactly but um just because that's the way it, it like it manifests itself it doesn't mean that it's not leftism or even worse that it's revisionist or any sort of Um, That kind of rhetoric, I think. Right. It's important to understand that um, a lot of leftist theory is built upon a scientific framework. And key Mm -hmm. to science is when a hypothesis is wrong, you revise it. Mm -hmm. And so to that regard, it is important to be like, wait, no, people in the 1800s didn't have a perfect understanding of what's going on now. You should look at their ideas to understand how things were back then, mm-hmm. see which of those ideas still apply and which of those ideas we need to revise in mm-hmm. order to continuously have a deeper understanding of the way the world works. Yeah, exactly. So, before we jump into this, do we introduce ourselves? Right. Hello. I'm Rakova. The pronouns are they, them, theirs, or really anything that isn't he or she. And I'm Mo, he, him, his. Um, and this is the Critical Weeb Theory Podcast. Gushing over Black Lagoon. 
from day one. <laughs> That's we we tricked you guys. It, we 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 um we said it was about to be materialist analysis on anime, but from here on out, it's just a Black Lagoon. Everything. <laughs> well, all right. This but is we're a materialist analysis of Black Lagoon. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're gonna half gush, uh, half analyze, and hopefully half bring some um, theory that some of you may be aware of, some of you may not, uh, some of you may be new to the entire concept, and some of you may be kind of familiar, but I think uh, hopefully we can uh, bring up some some of the stuff that you're familiar with from a new perspective. Uh, I think this is going to be a little bit more, I don't want to say more political, because our whole thing is that we are political, but I think more more based in, I guess... A discussion of like political text and and political action than some of the other episodes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, what is what is a black lagoon? Why is a black lagoon? H- how is a black lagoon? Isn't a lagoon like a lake? I hear you ask. Why is it black? Well, <laughs> I'm not sure why the show is called that. Actually, wait, no, it's called after the Lagoon Company. Never mind. Yeah, you know what a lagoon is. It's a it's a body of water that is almost it's it's like surrounded by mostly by land and it's like salty. Okay, let, <laughs> we're getting off. To, the point is not to define lagoons. The point is to define Black Lagoon. Uh, the show Black Lagoon is I have heard an anime. Black Lagoon is a story that was written by Rahiroe that was adapted into um, an anime. Um, that features uh, uh, four principal characters, Rock, Revy, Dutch, and Benny. Um, and uh, they form uh, something called a Lagoon Company. They're basically glorif- they're a glorified delivery service for um, the mob, uh, the mafia companies engaged in illicit activity. Drug dealers, human traffickers, so on and so forth. Yeah. Um... So our story begins um, with Rokuro Okajima who is a um, typical rank-and-file, I think, middle-income uh, businessman, salaryman, uh, at a, a faceless uh, Japanese corporation. Uh, he did, we're told he did everything right. He studied hard. He got into a good high school. He got into a good university. He was obedient. He got yep. his ass kicked when that was what was expected of him. He sucked up to everyone. We're told at the very beginning that even though he hates his job and he hates um, he hates being forced to to endure all the things he does at his job, he still hopes one day that he can be in the position of his boss. Um, we'll put a pin in that for later. One day he's um, tasked to deliver the contents of a disc uh, to an unknown source, and while he's out in the South China Sea. Uh, Pirates raid the boat, and they kidnap him, and they take the disc. Um, this turns out to be the Lagoon Company with the other three characters, Revy, Dutch, and Benny. Uh, these people are just being paid off by the um, the a section of the Russian mob and um, a former detachment of uh, the Red Army, uh, Hotel Moscow, uh, to take this disc and uh, to use it for their own purposes. It turns out that uh, on the disc was um, plans for a nuclear weapon that we're told they were selling to some um, to some impoverished uh, regime in the global south over another to profit off the war there. Um, it turned out not to be the business venture that they had hoped, so they essentially cut um, R- Rockero, who uh, eventually gains the nickname Rock, um, they essentially well, cut him loose and say... He gains... Um, the name Rock comes when uh, Rokuro introduces himself to Dutch, and Dutch shortens it to Rock. Mm-hmm. Um, there's this moment uh, before Rock... Uh, so there's this moment immediately after the disc is taken, and Rock is just sitting there like, what am I going to do? 
um, because he's now a captive of this pirate crew, and they're not really sure what to do with him either. And so, immediately after that, um, Dutch says, well, we're going out to town. You want to come with us, Rock? And that's the start of him getting his nickname, and it leads to a really interesting scene that shows how Rock is... Well, where it shows... It leads to an interesting scene where, at the bar, uh, Rock is challenged to a drinking contest by his comrade... Well, his soon-to-be comrade, Breffy. Mm. Um, yeah, so uh, Rock gets the nickname. They go to town. Um, there's this really um, slick bit of exposition where we kind of learn a bit more about who these characters are and how they got there. Um, Benny was like just a typical uh, American uh, university student who kind of pissed off the mafia. And then he met Revy that way. Uh, and Dutch, I don't think we learn his backstory quite at the beginning, but we do learn that uh, he's he's very intelligent and very um, very capable of, I think, making decisions, which kind of makes him um, the leader of the group. And instead of just being told uh, our characters' personalities, we're kind of shown a bit. There's this really good scene um, that Raghav was just about to mention where um, Revy kind of taunts Rock. Uh, she calls him a girl, basically, because he refuses to drink and this and that. And Rock, he goes on this really interesting tangent about how ever since college, he's basically been pressured to drink by people in situations that he doesn't want to, in college to fit in, at company socials to drink. His boss basically makes him drink. Um, and he... It, it, it introduces, I think, a rather interesting strength uh, that Rock has that will uh, follow us for the rest of the series in which um, the mentality of um, like a corporate salary man is exactly the same mentality that you need to survive in uh, the cutthroat, hyper-competitive, highly illicit um, environment that Black Lagoon takes place in. Um, it's also just like a really good scene where they kind of bond and they're we're shown that they're um competitive with each other they they like try and out drink each other but they're also like two entirely different people with entirely different life experiences like butting heads which is really great um later the the bar that they're that they're uh that they're staying in gets like attacked by uh by mercenaries who are were they hired by the company they were hired by the company to take back the disc. Um, there's a scene before when there's actually a cut to uh, Rock's old boss at the company mm. talking about uh, how much... And it, this scene is actually one of the more interesting ones. Because while this boss does show some level of I want to say concern for Rock's well-being. In the end, what he's more concerned about is the disc um, mm -hmm. and its contents, particularly how he laments that ah, nukes in this day and age, where he admits to the company is helping to produce nuclear weapons for a war-torn country because it is profitable. And his one hang-up is not, oh no, we're making weapons of mass destruction for a war-torn country. His one hold-up is, ah, imagine how much this image will affect our sales. Exactly. Um, so, uh, the, the fact that the, the company is willing to hire basically a paramilitary organization to take back the disc even if it means because rock is in the in the building at the time like the company very easily could have killed their own employee and it's very obvious that they don't care um so while he's getting shot at rock he, he has this like very um interesting outburst where he says like 
well, you know, I went through all the trouble of graduating college and I got a job at a big corporation. And where am I now? Like, what was it all for? Right. Um, and just over time, he begins to realize that uh, the 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 camaraderie that he finds with his kidnappers who are just using him for profit is much, much greater and much more genuine. Well, than... actually, they're not quite using him for profit, right? Oh, like yeah, the initial true. justification is that they'll use him for profit, but almost immediately after that, Dutch is like, nope, there's no way this is going to work out. Right. But they just kind of, they keep him anyway, and they let him tag along so that he doesn't die. Um, uh, and and he, he, over time, he, he realizes that, like, the Lagoon Company is more of a family than his, than his, than his uh, boss and his workplace ever was. There's a lot of bonding, a lot of we're getting attacked by an attack helicopter, a lot of um, scheming later, and eventually Rock proves himself as a valuable member of the Lagoon Company. Uh, there's the scene at the end of the second episode where um, Rock confronts his boss, and it's like this, it's supposed to be the big emotional moment. Like, I think in any run-of-the-mill average anime, it would be like this big moment, like the music is swelling, like it's the sunset where he casts aside his former abusive boss. And he says, you know what? I quit, right? And there's supposed to be this big, satisfying impact to it all of just like, yeah, I'm turning over a new leaf. I found my real friends. But um, the boss like doesn't care <laughs> Like, he, the boss was, was um, before this, he was more than willing to just, like, let Rock um, live in the South China Sea forever, uh, fake his death, and just kind of promote him to assistant manager, which means fucking nothing when you're stuck and stranded away from um, your well, home. He said, your... uh, you have been, you have received a promotion and everyone will be asked to attend your funeral. <laughs> Right. Those are those are the exact two lines back to back. Um, there's I, I what I really love about how this show starts is how they're how it like denies you the emotional closure of like sticking it to your boss. Right. Because at the end of the day, even if oh man, I'm reminded of this really dumb, uh, this really dumb clip from Tim Pool. If you don't know who that is, that's fine. He's he's reactionary. But um there's this dumb clip of how he, he used to work at Disney, and he said, well, I didn't want to do what Disney told me to do, so I went up to there, and I told them, I quit. I'm not going to do this anymore, right? But it's like the individual action of one person quitting their job and getting a better job does not challenge um, the state of power in the world. And as such, Black Lagoon knows not to give you that triumphant, like, Rock quit his job. He has a better job now because nothing is better. Nothing has changed. Rock is just. Rock perhaps is in like a better situation than he was or a more a situation that he's more comfortable with. But that that doesn't mean anything more than what it does in that moment. Yeah, for sure. And we are, of course, simplifying it quite a bit. There's a very epic action scene in there and it's all like well written it's not just here's what's going on but of course focusing on the political ends are what we do here so it's what we're gonna focus on yeah exactly um i think there's a i'm always a little nervous when we do like even when i when i write like my my regular essays i'm always a little nervous like when i when i go into like the political ideology of a show um, that um, people like forget that I'm also looking at like the writing quality and stuff like that. And like when I praise a show for having good politics, I, I I often try to make sure that you guys understand that it's not just that Black Lagoon has like really interesting politics. It's also just like well written. Um, you you basically fall in love with Rock instantly. The the dynamic of everyone in the Lagoon Company feels real. Um, there's definitely, I think, a the setting. We'll, we'll get to the issues with the setting, but uh, some of the some of the best parts of the setting are just that, like, 
on the one hand, it's like based in reality, and you can sort of like imagine a place like the city it takes place in Um but it's also like just like fantasized enough and just I think gussied up enough that you you have fun while you're there, and it's not just. Um, the show knows when to abandon realism just a little bit to get across like emotional or uh, thematic beats, which I think is mm-hmm. a, a really hard skill uh, for like a writer mm-hmm. to have. So speaking of the the setting, um, there is one little qualm of Black Lagoon that we do have that I think we are uh, obligated to bring up. Um, and it's that the entire show uh, takes place in Thailand and there's like no notable not like Southeast Asian characters or characters from Thailand or anything like that, which is sort of a shame because even if you're, if we're expanding more from, from Thailand, just to like Southeast Asia, like Vietnam is like right there, right? (laughs) There is one prominent Southeast Asian character in the bar owner whose bar gets shot up a lot and then never does anything of true relevance. Right. And it is honestly quite disappointing that a show that is otherwise good is otherwise, like, about a diverse array of experiences sort of just sidelines its Southeast Asian cast. Now, there is an... It's not even, like, doing it deliberately, I wouldn't say. Mm -hmm. It's not making an explicit point about the way in which sometimes in the so-called third world uh, people are made to play spectator to their own struggle as other larger superpowers, like, essentially play chess with their country. I I think it's it's safe to say that, like, Black Lagoon, it's, like, really focused on, and we'll get into this too, it's really focused on, like, this, like, post-Cold War um like power struggle between various factions that are all like shadows of their former selves um but then in doing that it kind of forget and it like picks like a neutral backwater um in which to 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 set this like grand battle of various factions and mafias and this and that but then uh in doing that it kind of forgets that the neutral uh, backwater that they picked is not a neutral backwater. Um, Thailand is, it's a place where people live and thus it is um, just as much a part of the struggle uh, towards liberation from capital than any other place on earth, right? And it kind of, unfortunately, forgets that a little bit as it's going through. Even if we're just talking about like, Southeast Asia in general, um, when you think about things like the model minority myth, Southeast mm-hmm. Asian people are often like erased and forgotten about. Most people, when they say the word Asian, well, they're rarely, in the US at least, they're very rarely, rarely mentioning South Asians, much less people from Southeast Asia or North right. Asia or the Middle East. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of thing. Um, the, the show's like the diversity in the show's cast really does come up and we'll 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 talk about this in just a sec. So it's like the diversity of the cast is like important. It's like important uh that Dutch is he's African American, he is a Vietnam War deserter. Um so like uh Dutch being um an African American who uh deserted the Vietnam War um, and Revy being like a Chinese American who had a really terrible childhood, um, much of it exacerbated by um, the racism and abuse of the police in New York City. Um, Benny um, being a Jewish American, like all of these things do come up, and they come up in ways that are like profound and They're like all American. Huh? Yeah. I actually hadn't realized. Um, we'll, we'll definitely get to that too. Um, 
I guess I hadn't realized because I I I was kind of confused on Dutch's origin. But regardless, um, all like the fact that the characters are diverse, like, does come up, and it comes up in a way that um doesn't really come up for a lot of anime. So then to see the show go that far in one direction to like include representation and like say political things about it and then in the other direction just kind of forget how much more there is it's just kind of it just kind of makes you sigh you know yeah okay so black lagoon really 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 hates nazis and like fascists like i will (laughs) clarify that more like sure plenty of shows are written by people who dislike nazis but black lagoon is all punch nazis all the time about nazis yes um there's a two episode arc uh in the first season uh actually i think it's more like three um but essentially uh what happens is there's a there's a nazi u-boat um that gets uh beaten by allied forces um, off the coast of uh, South Africa, and they sink. Um, and the Nazis on board are carrying aboard a painting that um, allegedly uh, Hitler had painted, but although we're, we're never actually sure if Hitler really did paint this or not. Um, and uh, the Nazis uh, at the time, they're really, really convinced that if they just get this painting uh, to Japan... Um, they can uh, revitalize their forces and turn the tide of World War II, which at that point, um, uh, the the fascists were being beaten by the Red Army in the East and by um, uh, the the kind of uh, bourgeois uh, American forces in the West. Um, but uh, as they as they sank uh, to the to the bottom of the ocean, um, they eventually get into a fight over basically nothing, over, like, the ideals of the painting. Um, they, they all die basically disgraced. Uh, th- they, they die at the bottom of the ocean, believing in a dying idea, um, and they kill each other for no reason. Other you than... heard it here first, folks. <laughs> Black Lagoon doesn't just kill Nazis. It makes them look like total fools. Right. It, well, it, it, okay. It, this is part of a uh, broader conversation on how should you portray Nazis in media if you are portraying Nazis. My answer is as follows. One, punchable. Two, wrong. And three, dangerous. Right. Which seem like it's very easy for us in... Uh, I've seen it happen a lot of for people in modern day America to say, oh, well, Nazis were obviously bad, but nothing like these ICE detention centers. And no, we're not directly comparing deportation centers to the Holocaust. But what we are saying is that there is a strong parallel as far as the just following orders or mass violations of human rights, especially with fascism on the rise in the United States. Exactly. Um, at the same time, if you lean too much into the here is the very real threat of fascism, people sometimes make fascism look sexy. Um, right. One show that does this that in a way that I don't like is The Legend of Korra, where it spends so much time getting us to empathize with a fascist, in, which it doesn't do for any of its other villains. Mm -hmm. which is disconcerting um so that's another bad which is why it's important to make it clear that these people are just absolute monsters who are wrong exactly and i feel like black lagoon does do that what i really like is that there's two sets of nazis um in the this arc uh there's like the there's like the main like the original nazis who sank at the u-boat and now there's like um like a neo-fascist expedition into the middle of the ocean to try and find it because all these like neo-nazis are like 
convinced that if they find the poster then and bring it back to the United States, then they'll like rally in like like another like revival of like white white nationalist fervor in the United States and they'll bring about their glorious life. You know, typical Nazi shit. Um but the thing about it is that if the Nazis, the original Nazis, were like pathetic, um, even if you had some sympathy for them because like, you know, they died pointlessly in the middle of an ocean for their ideals or whatever. Um That's not a good reason to have a sympathy for Nazis, by the way. Yeah, it's not right? that's not what I'm saying. Um, well, no, I'm not saying you're saying that. Mm-hmm. I just wanna briefly digress on anime. How they're like, oh, well, it's so noble and heroic to die for your ideals. I'm like, none of those ideals are fascism. <laughs> Basically. But even if you were tempted to kind of go down that rabbit hole, um, we're told that the neo-Nazis are, like, even worse. <laughs> because they're, like, pale imitations of the original who were already pathetic and pointless, right? <laughs> And and that's like like the genius thing. They're like these like fat like middle and, and we're we're kind of okay. That we'll get into I guess like fat phobia um, in a bit. But like they're just just these kind of like schlubby looking uh, middle aged men who could just be like living normal lives and not trying to bring about another genocide, right? But but here they are trying to do it anyway by finding a painting in the middle of the ocean and spending like so like 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 an exorbitant amount of money just getting this painting back right um white supremacy not even once (laughs) not even once um at at the end of course after um a couple of back and forth between the lagoon company and this neo-fascist group over the painting um there's eventually like a very long drawn out sequence in which um, uh, Revy and Dutch and um, Benny, to a lesser extent, he's more of like the tech guy. He doesn't really fight, but like Revy and Dutch basically um, brutally mow down um, every single neo-fascist on the very on the violent, very blood bloody, and we one hundred percent condone doing this to Nazis in real life. <laughs> oh, no, the critical weed theorists are advocating for violence. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, yes. If you want to report this, if you want to report this from YouTube, fucking do it. I dare you. I, dare, I fucking dare you. <laughs> we'll stand by every single day. Um, but, but there's there's some sort of like cathartic satisfaction um in watching like a black man and like like a Chinese woman basically like kind of like two of like some of like the biggest victims of fascism in the in in recent history and like obviously like a Jewish man just like absolutely um destroy people who want to bring those ideas back um it it's it it kind it it builds up i think um a hatred not just of like nazis in a general like they were the villains of the 20th century sort of thing but like in a very specific their ideas are pathetic and they hurt us and they're not nearly as superior as they think they are and they need to stop and they need to stop now um and it kind of like brings that all in into just like a couple of episodes of anime um yeah and at the end uh dutch like talks to the white supremacist who's funding this and they have like this really interesting conversation where um he basically says like you know you're like a good negro because like you managed to outsmart me this time around and so on and so forth and it's just it's 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 good fucking shit that's all i have to say like (laughs) i think i think that statement needs a lot more clarification you can't say the white supremacist says you're a good negro and then follow it up with that's good shit contextually okay Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll. It makes more sense in my head than I think the words that came out. Um, it does. It does. Start again. Right. So, um, when uh, when Dutch and like the white supremacist leader have this conversation, um, there's this moment I think where the white supremacist leader tries to rationalize how um, his Aryan forces basically got wiped out by someone 
who thinks who he thinks is inferior to them and he kind of chalks it up to you know um it's it's hard to find good help number one and that dutch is like some sort of like model exception to the general rule that black people are inferior um and, that, and that's kind of what what we mean by like like the good negro thing um when when white supremacists see like a black person who they like or any other person of like a racial um like a racial group that they deem inferior um who is uh, more capable than they would expect they immediately start saying like oh well you know you should you should use your talents to serve my cause you know uh you should be a tool that i could use you know as like an individual person as like like an individual who is um um who is better than some of the some of the examples of like the Aryan race there's actually uh i was reading a I think one of the interviews that the Proud Boys do, if you don't know, the Proud Boys are a, um, they're not, they're not like a whites only group, but they're definitely like a white supremacist fascist group. In the United States, um, they show up to uh, anti-fascist rallies, um, they beat people up, um, they threaten violence, so on and so forth. They face um, no repercussions for their actions because they a lot of old systems of white supremacist heteropatriarchy. Yep. That everyone else is complicit in um but there is this one um there's this one interview i think that they did where they said uh we can't possibly be racist um because we recognize that uh the the bell curve uh in iq overlaps right so there are some black people who indeed can be better than some white people right but well no, you're still you're still a racist prick well, he let's actually, I think, I think I want to take a moment to like break down all of the things that are going wrong with that, just because it's common misinformation. And I think we might as well. Okay, um, yeah, sure. So for one, IQ is not an accurate representation of intelligence. It is at best measuring a single type of intelligence and at worst, hor- worst, horribly unreliable, even at that, because um, you can study for IQ tests and change how much your IQ score is represented by. So it's hardly like if all you need access to in order to score well on an IQ test is access to lots of well-funded educational materials, then of course, people who are white privileged and thus more likely to um, have access to those materials are going to be like fucking, you know, they're going to score better on IQ tests. Right. Um, I- IQ, it measures a set of like cognitive skills that we have decided to, to label intelligence, right? Mm-hmm. But does that... Um, I, I think one of the most, uh, we, we, okay, we can get caught up in the weeds of what IQ does and does not represent and its, um, relations to like global IQ scores and why some populations apparently score higher or lower than others. But I think, um, the, the damning thing about IQ is that it is not the most, it is not by far, um, the metric that best um, predicts success in life. Um, familial wealth is the metric that best predicts uh, that best predicts success in life. Um, well, the, the well department... let's, let's actually add a note of what is success. If we say acquiring personal wealth is your metric for what is success, then the best way to acquire personal wealth is to have familial wealth. Right. Yeah, there is um the Department of Education, for example, uh, they uh, they tracked um, uh, test scores with uh, graduating uh, with graduation rates and with uh, uh, jobs um, after college, right? Um, and and test scores, especially like for like the SAT, they they kind of track pretty well onto IQ tests. Um, but what they found was that. Um, 
poor kids who scored very, very well on tests basically always ended up um, less successful in life than rich kids who scored worse on tests, right? And so if IQ is supposed to be the be-all, end-all for like cognitive capacity, if you can take a test and the test determines whether or not you're successful and this and that, then why is it that, <laughs> that um, poor kids who do well on all the metrics that you say um, determine success still um, drop out of high school at higher rates, drop out of college at higher rates, end up in worse jobs, end up in more debt? It's almost as if um, there is a global system of exploitation that like heavily hampers what people can and cannot do and what people want and, and, and don't want to do and what, what they have access to being able to, um, to being able to do. Right. Yeah. Fundamentally, so, mm -hmm. what IQ is, is it is a tool of effectively eugenics to look at a marginalized underserved population and say they deserved what they got because they had a low number according to this set of metrics that I have decided are my measures of success. And that's not even like strictly true. And so that's why it's especially like wrong when um, the Proud Boys say, we're not racist because we acknowledge that black people can be smart too. That argument doesn't work because the assumption they're making there is that the average black person is less smart than the average white person. And that's a racist assumption. Right. So when we talk about tearing that apart, it's not sufficient to say, oh, well, you know, your bell curve is wrong. It's actually more than the average or whatever, right? Like, no, you have to critique the underlying assumption that is that these are the assumed defaults. Right, because at the end of the day, you're still going to, you're still going to use that, um, that statistic to like, uh, justify a uh, racist policy, right? Like, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you're still going to say we need to bar immigration from well, XYZ I place. I would go a step further than you're going to use it to justify racism and eugenics to, that is the point of IQ. No one brings up IQ to be like, well, I guess we're all smart, huh? Right, no one's bringing up IQ to... Um, to talk about human liberation, right? Yeah. And if so, they were, they would be talking about how IQ is a useless metric in terms exactly. of human li liberation. Um, yeah, so I just want to, back to the point on the Proud Boys, I felt like that was important yeah, to talk about. So um, when this, uh, when this uh, white supremacist leader from Black Lagoon kind of uh, laments on how Dutch would have been, he's like one of the good ones, and he perhaps would have been more useful uh, if he uh, had decided to, like, I don't know, help him with, like, his goals of, like, establishing, uh, like, a neo-fascist move in the United States. It's, like, a very, um, I think, relevant moment uh, from Black Lagoon. Um, that it, like, a as you can see, there is just so much to <laughs> to well, unpack I think, just in I that think, little in that I little think moment. we also talked about it in a previous episode, or if not that, a previous recording of a previous episode in which you talked about this idea that the quote-unquote smart black people were said to be white on the inside by fascist settler colonizers. Oh, yeah. Um, why don't we actually get into that? Because we could. I think there we're, a... we're digressing on the point, but it's an important digression, and we'll get yeah. back to Black Lagoon and its fat phobia eventually. Mm-hmm. So, um, essentially, uh, there was something called um, Hamai theory, and this is like in the traditional European racial classification. Uh, these are where we get terms like Caucasian and uh, Negroid and all sorts of other stuff. Um, but uh, when European colonizers went to Africa, uh, sometimes they saw, actually not sometimes, but all the time, they saw civilization. And sometimes they even saw civilization that was uh, impressive. Uh, well, so for they example, always, every single civilization they saw was impressive. They just, mm -hmm. it was they, just a question of whether or not they could recognize it. Mm -hmm. But I think 
impressive in a way that could not easily be uh, dismissed. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, for example, uh, when uh, uh, settlers found uh, the abandoned city of Great Zimbabwe, um, I don't know if you've uh, actually seen uh, pictures of Great Zimbabwe, but basically... No, I sure wasn't shown pictures of Great Zimbabwe in school. <laughs> but essentially, it's like this, it's like this really big city um, with all these uh, buildings in it. And all the buildings are like built by stone, but they don't use any cement in the stone whatsoever. Like um, the the um, the builders of the city had like such a knowledge of like physics and like mechanical architecture that they basically built like these big elaborate sort of like walls and like um, infrastructure, just like knowing how to pile stones um, uh, in in various positions, right? And so um, um, Zimbabwe, of course, is in southern, eastern um, Africa. Uh, and so when uh, people saw this, for example, for a long time, um, the academic consensus was that uh, Great Zimbabwe was actually built um, by Arabs who had settled there because black people are just uh, too stupid to understand um, the sophistication of Newton's laws, I guess. It's just, it's too much for uh, our tiny brains. Um, <laughs> I would... I, I would hope not, uh, given that I'm trying to do a physics minor right now, but I digress, right? <laughs> um, so Hamite theory, um, so it, it's, it's, it, it came into a lot of situations like that when European colonizers found, found things that kind of challenged their assumptions on race. Uh, one of the things that they said for uh, you know, moving a little of, north. Ooh, wait, hey, hold on. Mm-hmm. This ties back into an earlier point where we were making where instead of reevaluating the theory, changing the hypothesis to mm. better match reality, these fucking book worshipping theory nerds racist theory nerds. <laughs> these racist white book worshipping settler colonizers. Oof. Mm. Got them. Um absolutely destroyed. They uh, just said, well, our assumptions are right. These are just exceptions. Mm-hmm. You know, it was, it, was, it was white people all along. We don't need to have our whiteness threatened. Exactly. So, um, uh, what, what they uh, eventually decided was that um, a lot of the black people, especially like uh, more in like Eastern Africa, who uh, had... Um, what they considered to be advanced uh, civilizations were actually, um, like in Ethiopia especially, um, a lot of them had to be uh, descendants of Ham. And if you're familiar with uh, uh, biblical knowledge, Ham was uh, one of the sons of Noah. Um, And so essentially, and uh, Noah, of course, uh, being from the Middle East, uh, they would consider that like Caucasian, and so um, essentially the argument was that all these civilizations had um, descendants uh, from, there were essentially white well, people. Well, they were just whitewashing religious texts when they said, like, Noah being from the Middle East made him Caucasian. Right, exactly. But um, they used that to just say that uh, um, black people who are successful are really just the white people who became like negrosized over time and whose genes were diluted by uh, the inferior race, but they still have like the natural impulse to build some kind of society. Right. Um, and it's, it's so racist. It's, super it's so racist. wrong, but of course it's wrong because it, it's first and foremost priority was to justify racism. Mm hmm. But the the thing about Hamite theory that's um, kind of scary is that um, it is one of like the direct causers of uh, the the Rwandan genocide. Because essentially, what the the Belgians did uh, when they arrived in Rwanda is they said um, uh, the they said one of the ethnic groups here are um, are are descendants of Hamites, and the other ones are not. And so we will give one of you all these special privilege. We will essentially task one group uh, with the job of oppressing the other group. And when uh, the colonizers left, what they had left behind was essentially um, an ethnostate 
that was um, set up in favor of the one group over the other. And the logical conclusion of a nationalist ethnostate, which, by the way, in and of itself is a European construct, um, is the genocide of all the people and the expulsion of all the people um, who are outsiders um, of the ethnostate. And then, of course, when we talk about the Rwandan genocide, we talk about how um, Africans just have a tribal conflict. You know, they're they're so caught up in in uh, ancient wars and and they're not civilized enough to not fight. But the so-called tribal conflict was entirely manufactured uh, by Europeans <laughs> for power. And then when they left, it continued to be used by the powerful against the powerless. So that's kind of. That one little scene in Black Lagoon, I think, just evokes uh, so much knowledge in terms of... uh, It's got a lot going on. It really does. It's got a lot going on. We wanted to talk about the fat phobia. I haven't forgotten. Oh, yeah. Um, It's just worth... Well, it's worth acknowledging that it's there at the very least. Yeah, it just... I guess a small comment on, like using like larger bodies as like an indicator of patheticness i think as is done with uh the the nazis to some extent uh is it it is problematic um just because people people should be comfortable with themselves uh, no matter what they look like and it does also actually large lead to, like, people can be attractive yes i mean just true. look at decadence for a show mm-hmm. that amongst all of the other things it did correctly it has, like, people of different body types. Mm-hmm. And it just has them. Yeah. And there's, like, not, like, a big deal. It's not, like, fucking... Oh, God, I've been watching Franks lately. Oh, for me. God. <laughs> but, like, there's, like, a there's like a larger character in Franks. Every single time he's on screen, I swear to God, every single time, it's just, like, he either has food in his mouth or he's talking about wanting food. And it's just... <sighs> It's just written with like a, a such like an unbelievable contempt for people who are who have like weight on them that it's like, <laughs> please, please shut up. This isn't the Frank's episode. Thankfully, thankfully for both you and me, it's not the Frank's episode. Um, we'll we'll get around to it. Let's please no. We <laughs> <laughs> would like to never talk about that show again. Um, actually, the Frank's darling in the Frank's. Plus conception for the double gut punch whammy. Oh yes, <laughs> that that's just a masochist. <laughs> Are you a ready masochist. to make the babies yet? <laughs> uh, back to where Absolutely. we were. Um, okay. Yeah, so I think it's just, uh, of course, our big thing is that we try to be as intellectually honest as possible, and that mm-hmm. includes acknowledging that hey. Our faves can be problematic at times. Yep. Um, I'm actually going to pass this off to you um, because there was, uh, there's this scene between Rock and Revy that's like really emotionally resonant. And see, I don't have emotions, right? If you ask me about like um, uh, the, the inherent liberalism and gender essentialism of Darling in the Franks, I will talk all day. But if you ask me about like um, scenes in anime that make me feel things, I'll be like, no, I don't want to feel things. I'm a jaded, I'm a, I'm a jaded edgy boy, please. Plus, um, yeah. So, where do we even begin? I suppose we begin by saying, I am romance trash. Uh, I, romance is my genre that is what I actively seek out and actively try to consume as much as possible about it. On that note, a lot of time there will be a kiss scene in a romance and I will feel absolutely nothing because there is no meaning for it. Black Lagoon doesn't have a kiss scene in the traditional sense. Um, what happens is, I think it's in the aftermath of the Nazi episode, right? Uh, might be. Yeah, at, at the end of one of the episodes, uh, Rock and Ravi get into basically a huge fight over something or the other, and it ends with them throwing 
bowls over the place and they sort of can you get the contact i i remember the scene with perfect clarity mm-hmm. i can yeah no um i'll just talk about it um in the aftermath they're in balalaika's car they're just sort of sitting there and um Revy passes rock a cigarette and then if you if you want we can kind of pause for a bit and like watch we, the scene. um don't stop recording but like mm-hmm. pull it up and we'll just watch over it okay what i will say about the scene is there is a cigarette kiss that follows a fight that's more intimate than just about any kiss in any other romance and it's beautiful oh, it's um, very good I don't think there's anything, any more justice I can do it with my words than to say, watch it. I will add the necessary disclaimers to say that Black Lagoon, the fight that precedes it is heated and uh, could potentially be triggering if you have like uh, those around like trauma and stuff, but... Mm -hmm. It uses a lot of strong language, I think. Not language that you would necessarily endorse. And but... they're also just shouting at each other mm-hmm. really violently. Um, mm-hmm. Revy points a gun at him and threatens to kill him mm-hmm. in the scene in a fit of rage. And uh, I know, especially if you've experienced that sort of thing of physical threats of violence from someone you trust in real life that's like a yikes so yeah there is your warning i think the scene is very good mm-hmm. because um there's this really interesting line where revy having been basically civilized into apathy from years of living in literal actual hell basically says like this isn't a hollywood tale there is no robin hood and rock perhaps very naively says, if there is no Robin Hood, why don't you become Robin Hood? Right. And I think this is, it's, it's, it's another one of those cases where, um, like, the political and then just, like, the, like the, the personal sort of come together. Um, the, the intimacy of the scene works because... They had just fought, and now they're coming together. Um, but the cigarette kiss also works in the sense that, like, we have like these two sort of competing ideals. Rock, who's still under the impression that like um, you can work to make the world a better pl- a better place, and Revy, who has just been so thoroughly well, burned. I would by say the- that Rock's not necessarily under like the misguided impression that uh you can work to make the world a better place but i think his idea of what it takes to make the world a better place is naive at best yeah um i I will say like as revolutionary socialists or communists or well leftists in general uh key to who we are is accepting that the world can be improved Mm. quite a big deal and i think rock's fault in the scene and I do think this is the way it is intended, is not that he believes the world can be made better, but rather that his his conceptualization of what needs to be done to make the world better is naive at best and comes off as pa- it comes off as very patronizing when he says, yeah, I don't know you, but you don't know me either. Like, yeah, but I think you're missing the point. Yeah, there's definitely... Uh, I think the the characters in the scene, and I think this is one of my favorite parts of Black Lagoon. Um, the characters in Black Lagoon all kind of see Rock as like a naive sort of white collar guy who um doesn't really know what it's really like. And so when Rock starts to get kind of inclinations that maybe we can help people, maybe we can save people, maybe we can like stop so many people from suffering um people kind of uh, the other characters in the scene kind of brush it off as no rock that's not how this works rock 
you're still in the you're still tiptoeing between the light and the dark rock you got to choose you got to pick one right um and i think that's something that any other show could easily like lean into but what black lagoon says is no 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 rock is correct in the sense that um the systems that make people miserable can be changed he's only wrong insofar that he thinks that his efforts as an individual can 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 um topple like the entire uh can topple the entire regime of global capital but he is we right that it can be challenged we will we, we will get, get to that it actually is very important when we talk about the ova um but before we get to the ova uh i gotta talk about the last two episodes especially the last episode of, of the, the first, first season, season because oh my oh, <laughs> oh it's so fire oh. chef's kiss mm-hmm so essentially, there's a okay. So in the last two episodes, um, there's an arc about um, essentially uh, a jihadist group, a protectors of the Islamic Front, is called, um, based in Southeast Asia, who are um, planning an attack on uh, like a CIA base um, in the area um, as a retribution for uh, the U.S.'s um, continued support uh, for apartheid Israel. Um, and uh, they're teamed up with uh, a, a former member of the Japanese Red Army, uh, Mashiro Takanaka, um, who is just like an open communist. Like, I think we talk he a lot about... He says the word petty bourgeois. Yeah, I think we talk, we will, we talk and we will continue to talk about shows um, that have communist characters in the sense that like um, their philosophies are communist. For example... Uh, Decadence, I think, has quite a few uh, communist characters in it, but they're not, like, talking about the bourgeoisie by name, of course. They're communists in the sense that, like, in the context of the show, they are against, like, the facsimile of um, calculus, (laughs) of capitalism. But uh, in Black Lagoon, yeah, he's he's just a communist. He's read read the theory. He's done the praxis. uh, there was, uh, in case you don't know, uh, the Japanese Red Army was a mostly student movement mm-hmm. um, based in Japan uh, during uh, the the seventies, um, and uh, at the time they were like a very militant, often uh, often violent uh, communist group that um, both supported that both supported the establishment of communism in Japan and also um, worked like around the worked with uh, other groups around the world uh, against imperialism. Uh, So um, these two, um, these two people essentially like uh, worked together to like bring about this attack on the, on the CIA base. Um, uh, eventually, what happens is that the plans kind of fall through. Um, the Lagoon Company is hired by the CIA to uh, to uh, get the plans uh, from the protectors of the Islamic Front beforehand, uh, so that they can stop the attack. Uh, and uh, during that time, Rock is captured uh, by um, Takenaka, uh, and when he is, they have this conversation. Rock at first he starts off, I think like most people who haven't been introduced to communism start off just like i know what you guys did you guys were monsters i know what you did to our country you had to flee so on and so forth you know communism it killed like a hundred million gajillion people it's 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 bad Karl marx personally killed ten thousand people (laughs) right came into the present from the past to kill my dad Exactly. Right. Um, but Takanaka starts like talking to Rock, like in we we're we're never really led to believe if it's just an interrogation tactic or if they're actually like connecting. Or maybe it's a little bit of both. But they they talk and Takanaka sort of he mentions he mentions uh essentially being a preacher and trying to gather people to make the world a better place. And he's talking from the perspective of 
essentially a revolutionary whose whose revolution failed. Like uh, the Japanese Red Army did not succeed in in bringing about communism in Japan, obviously. Not and yet. Not yet. <laughs> and the new Japanese Red Army is a lot less uh, militant. Like Japanese communism since then has been a lot less militant and a lot more um, willing to work within bourgeois democracy to try and achieve their ends, which we, we can talk about the merits or not of that in a, in an, at another time. Um, however, he is in a period in which um, his main thrust of revolutionary action has not yielded the results that he had hoped. And he talks about how he, how he continues to fight because if he doesn't, then it's like everything that he put his life into um, was just for nothing. But what I, I think what I really liked about this um, what I really liked about this arc is, uh, like Black Lagoon's, I think really interesting uh, criticisms of of uh, socialism um, and communism, because it does have criticism of socialism and communism. I think it's like like an like explicitly socialist, um, explicitly anti imperialist text, um, but it, it has criticisms in the sense that. Um, it has criticisms in the sense that uh, uh, it kind of views a lot of um, socialist tendencies as being stuck in the past. Um, we have, for example, uh, Balalaika, who is like, who is a um, to use the a term that the kids use. Um, Balalaika is the the head of the Russian mafia Hotel Moscow, um, but um, she's kind of uh, a simp uh, for the USSR <laughs> in Ooh. the sense that. <laughs> She she really really um, she really idolizes the USSR and she kind of resents um, the reformist efforts that um, led to its collapse and uh, likewise um, uh, Taknaka he kind of um, he brings up the fact that um, one of the reasons why his movement failed is because a lot of his fellow revolutionaries were too busy looking at like past revolutions and like standing up for their ideals instead of um, recognizing the material reality of what is happening to them and adjusting to them. Well, another thing he says is also that people agreed with him initially, but once things got better for them, they stopped caring. Right, which is another just really good, um, really good line. Um, it's kind of... I if. I, 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 it's hard for me to say like the one episode of Black Lagoon you should watch if you were only to watch one, but twelve is really interesting to watch. I think if you are a communist, because it just kind of it speaks to a lot of like I think the frustration of revolutionary tendencies that we have, in which is just like okay, we're just talking about Joe Biden again. Okay, <laughs> we can't get health care. Okay. <laughs> I think a point I want to make is mm. that while the Lagoon Company is usually our protagonist, and the Lagoon Company is working for the CIA here, the people mm. we get to empathize with are the communists and the Palestinian fighting mm. for liberation. Right. Compare that to the CIA, who only shows up at the end says, and says explicitly in these words, oh, well, we're only paid to deal with threats to the United States of America, not deal with crimes. <laughs> right, oh, that was basically. Such a... like, like, legit, like, the CIA just pops in at the end, comes in, and says, like, You're oh, late, well, Langley. That's because Langley's busy. Too many assholes shitting on freedom and justice everywhere. <laughs> It's such a good line. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's literally just like, wow. Um, where the CIA basically is only there to uphold American state interests and not to make the world a better place. And you compare that to, like, Takanaka and Ibraha. Ibraha is fighting for freedom, but also, like, to avenge his dead son. Um, Takanaka is fighting for like a broader social revolution where everyone can live in like health and harmony, right? 
And so, like, in spite of being opposed to the Black Lagoon on the outset, they are the characters we, as the audience, are led to empathize with more, is what I would say. Right. And I, last thing on this, um, and then we'll talk about uh, Roberto's blood trial. Um, the the one thing that's just uh, super interesting about about uh, I think the the meeting between um, Rock and uh, Takanaka is that Rock kind of he begins the process of radicalization in the sense he that he just sticks to that like yeah. not even after like everything is resolved. He's still thinking about it. There's a line where after Takanaka escapes, um, well, one, he just says, who am I? I'm an enemy of the state, which is oh, like, yeah, yeah he's just, <laughs> such an he's amazing just a fucking communist. Um, mm-hmm. But also, he laments that he wasn't able to pass on the torch to someone of the next generation, that person of the next generation being Rock. But we do see that Rock's heart is swayed a little. He's not an out-and-out communist. This is not about to, like, start advocating for the overthrow of global capitalism starting from Southeast Asia, but... He does... He does start thinking, like, why am I just living life seeing all this, like, horrible shit happen day in and day out and participating in it? Why do I... He, he describes this as just running away again and again. Um, the scene is a little bit uh, comedic because he's high <laughs> and the driver is high <laughs> as well. Oh, man, there's this, this, is, uh, there's this tangent, <laughs> but there's this great light. So, like, the, they're, like, r- driving away from uh, uh, all the people from the protectors of the Islamic Front who are, like, shooting at them, right? <laughs> and the driver is, like, this Irish dude. <laughs> And then just in the middle of the conversation, unprompted, he just yells, What? My application to the Black Panthers was denied again? <laughs> uh, and it just gets me rolling every time. Um, but yeah, but it's, it's in that context where he starts thinking, like, why maybe, maybe Takanaka had a point. Maybe, um, maybe I can, like, make a difference in this world. But he just, he doesn't have, like, the time to really develop like revolutionary criticism right because he just spends all his time just nose to the grindstone uh making a living for uh with the lagoon company which actually i think segues right into um, roberto's blood trial um there is so roberto's blood trial is a series of five ovas they're like 30 minutes long they're even more violent than regular black lagoon it's like if you liked black lagoon there were like whatever restrictions they had to make Black Lagoon, they just kind of untied it. And it's like the most Black Lagoon Black Lagoon has ever been. But the reason why I say this um, this uh, t- ties together is because one of the uh, most common criticisms of Roberto's blood trial is that Rock kind of becomes like, like an evil mastermind, basically. He's um, presented with a situation where he has all these different factions like um we'll go into in more detail but he's dealing with FARC which is like another revolutionary communist tendency um, from Colombia he's dealing with the mafia he's dealing with all these people he's dealing with the the Hong Kong triad and he basically says I'm going to make Rwanapur a better place not by targeting individuals but by targeting um the interests that run Rwanapur I'm going to target the mafia, I'm going to target the drug trade, I'm going to target the cartels, I'm going to target all of these people, and I'm going to move them in a way that finally makes the world better. And so people say, why would Rock turn into this kind of person? But I think it's like a direct continuation of all the hints we get in the main story, that he's kind of starting to think that maybe all this capitalism bullshit that he sees in his day-to-day life uh, can possibly be changed. For absolutely sure, um, uh, Rock's grand plan to fix Rowanapur is to basically show the USA that it's there. This, of course, is hindered by the fact that 
the CIA has a base in Rowanapur and has a vested interest in keeping things exactly the same way they are. And so there's this big moment at the, like right near the end of Roberta's blood trail when all of the blood has started to dry and Rock's like, I did it. I feel like I'm going to make the world a better place because he like helped an American operation succeed. And then after it, nothing changes. And he's like, I don't understand what happened. Not only does nothing change, um, but the Hong Kong triad actually pays him for a job well done when he thought that he was uh, moving against the interests of the Hong Kong triad. Yeah. Um, And what is, well, what's going on here is the fact that even though he thought he was doing something is that in the end he was functioning alongside like in alignment to capitalist interest and capitalist interest was i guess i would say that rock's ideology there was the same ideology as the sort of people who are like well we need to advocate for u.s intervention in nigeria or like imposing sanctions to deal with the Ansar's movement, which is like a uh, wide-scale Nigerian protest against um, police brutality. Of course, this ignores the fact that U.S. corporations benefit from being aligned to, you know, the state. So I wanted to uh, take a moment to describe like what Rock's plan is in the OVA. Essentially, uh there's a, a character named roberta who we meet um she's like a very good character she was like a former uh communist revolutionary who kind of fled um and she like she's like a maid for like uh the poorest great uh, south american family um there are a bunch of south american families that like had a lot of like um influence and power i mean they're all colonizers of course um but she like protects this this child um and that's kind of become oh, yeah. her life um, um the inciting incident for roberta's blood trail is when um fucking fucking um the cia it like yeah the cia assassinates uh roberta's master when they or the nsa assassinates roberta's master when they try to kill a bunch of left-wing politicians in South America, which, you know, happens. Right, they, they literally assassinate a politician <laughs> to instigate a right-wing military coup. <laughs> so people that's people say the... Black Lagoon isn't political and is dumb. Right. Um, yeah, but then, uh, so she comes to Rwanda, well, like, basically with a bloodlust to kill all the imperialists who killed uh who killed her master and then uh so there's all these like different and like the cartel is like after her because like she screwed them over and so there's like five different groups um uh running around Rwanda and basically um uh, the uh, the master's son like contacts rock and they're like help me find Roberta and rock is like okay um, I'm going to use this opportunity um, to end the drug trade in Rwanda. He he um, directly points out that like the drug trade is why um, the cartel, um, the mafia, the Hong Kong triad are all able to survive. And so what he thinks is that if he can get, um, if he can end um, the drug trade, if he can get a, uh, if he can get uh, the CIA to like come in and bust uh, the drug trade then uh, Rwandapur will be a better place because the, the interests that allow all these exploitative entities to exist will have been uh, destroyed. Um, he makes one miscalculation, and it's like the crucial one. He, he, gets, he gets all of his information on where people are going to be um, from, uh, they call it the ripoff church. It's a church that's like a front for like a lot of illicit activities, right? And he has everything in place, but his one question is like, where is the church getting all this information? Who's backing them? What he doesn't realize is that the church is a front for the CIA. And so the CIA is giving him all this information because the CIA 
um, wants to destroy, wants to, wants to attack these drug dealers, but not, of course, to end the drug trade, but um, simply to um, get rid of interests that are problematic for the United States, so they can reassert its influence over Rwanda. So, like, it's that's why, um, as Rugby was saying, it's like a really good um, scene at the end where he realizes that nothing's changed. And the reason why he's, he's realized that nothing changed is because even though he tried to challenge all of the material interests in Rowanipur, he missed the one tiny little bit, which is that the tool he was using to try and fix it was also in and of itself an interest that had, um, that had, an, that had a stake in keeping Rowanipur uh, the way it is. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, and I think a little bit longer of a podcast than normal, but... I think that's Black Lagoon. <laughs> Maybe not in its entirety, but I think in a way that be- that even begins to scratch the surface of everything the show has to offer. Mm-hmm. The big question, I think, when watching Black Lagoon, and we have our own answer, but if you're watching this episode, we would love to hear your answer, is Black Lagoon is fundamentally a show that like is very much about communism and takes a huge influence so then the question is is black lagoon overall sympathetic to revolutionary tendencies i think you would say that it is because of the way they're framed but you could also very much argue that well uh people like takanaka and ibraha are placed as antagonists to the lagoon company in those moments, Fark is placed as an antagonist to Roberta during Roberta's blood trails. So is Black Lagoon arguing that the opposite? Well, um, I, it, it really is an open-ended question. Media interpretations. Complicated. It is. Another option, and you guys can tell us uh, in the comments and on Twitter what you think but another option is simply that black lagoon is just nihilist in that it is sympathetic to communism in the sense that it thinks that a communist uh, like uh, a communist like world would be better than a capitalist one but it does not believe in the ability of communists to actually bring about that world and kind of posits that we'll just live in squalor and exploitation just forever which is it, there's the argument that either Black Lagoon sympathizes with Takanaka's perspective, it sympathizes with Rock's naive perspective, which I think that's the least defensible assertion, or perhaps Black Lagoon empathizes with Revy's perspective, that, yeah, we're all fucked under capitalist exploitation. What are you going to do about it? Right. Um, and I think... A large re- part of the reason why I think um, Black Lagoon sympathizes with Takanaka's perspective above all is because I empathize with that perspective. <laughs> a nihilist would probably read the show differently. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh... Let us know what you think, though. Um, that was Black Lagoon. Mm-hmm. Um, it comes with the highest recommendation alongside several asterisks right so other than um, that, do we have a do we have a closing topic what have you been doing lately um i guess we'll do a quick global politics shout out um everything's fucked you yeah. <laughs> by the time this comes out uh the presidential election in the united states will be right around the corner it will be around a week from when this is released um well we might actually do a thing about anime elections and anime politics mm-hmm. yes. we definitely should regardless of um i think whether or not you've engaged in the electoral process and have voted um and regardless of your um feelings about that i think one thing that can and should be stressed uh, is that whatever happens, uh, we're going to need people um, fighting for uh, justice Mm -hmm. and equality. Like we, we made some jokes in this, uh, in this podcast, 
in this podcast episode. Um, don't do don't do anything reckless that would endanger yourself unnecessarily. However, um, uh, there will be need of protest. Um, there will be need of organizing. There will be need of strikes. There will be need of radicalization in the next coming. There will be need essentially to keep the to keep the energy that we saw over the summer over um, the outrageous slaughter of um, various um, black lives at the hands of the police, we will need to carry that through um, both when, uh, if and when uh, the current president decides not to cede power and then afterwards um, in a hopeful transition to a, uh, a Biden administration, we will need that same anger against all of um, his future bullshit as well. Right. I think the most important thing as a revolutionary leftist going forward is to keep the energy. Um, we've had the reform versus revolution conversations many times, it, to which I say, sure, a reform is better than not having a reform, but we're not here to bargain for reforms. Um, and so it's important to not let uh, the revolutionary energy die just because things have a, like aesthetically is my new favorite word but just because things have it's aesthetically gotten better like as long as the underlying principles are the same like we need to do better than what we're doing right now as takanaka said uh, people tend to no longer believe in a need for change when they're doing personally a little bit better when they kind of fail to see the bigger picture mm-hmm and so, um, one thing I think we're going to, if you join our Discord, which is in the description, we have an entire channel uh, dedicated towards international indigenous politics because it's important to understand the ways in which people in the global south are exploited, what's going on, and more importantly, one, the ways in which we can help, but also like what we can learn from this sort yeah, of thing. to like build our own movements uh, here in the Imperial Corps. All right, uh, with that, uh, this has been Mo Black. He, him, his. Rajava, me on Twitter. Um, anything other than he, he, he she. And um, this has been the Critical Media Podcast. Yeah, I hope to see you guys next week.